Hello everyone. On behalf of India Foundation for the Arts, welcome. This is a program that we do called Date with the Archive. So a little bit about India Foundation for the Arts. We are an organization that supports and implements projects in the arts and culture across the country. And as some of you know, we have completed 25 years of doing this. We are in our 26th year. And during this time, over 700 projects have received support or have been implemented by us across the region in various languages, across disciplines. And the outcome of these projects as performances, articles, publications, books, uh, exhibitions, films are out there in the public domain for you to witness. A few years ago, we realized that while they are all in the public domain, they are scattered across uh, many platforms, many other institutions and archives. And we felt that it might make sense to have all that material with us in one place where we can um, preserve them, conserve them for future, for artists, scholars, researchers to look at them and use them. As you know, the copyright of all this material belongs to the artists and scholars who have worked on them. Uh, so we began this process of collecting this material in the hope that we can build an IK archive. Delighted to tell you that with help from the Indorama Charitable Trust, we were able to start work on this archive. And in 2018 October, we finally launched this archive. So the IFA archive today is an online platform where you can find about close to over 400 projects and their materials. And we are in the process of adding every day a few more projects to it. And we'll soon catch up with our 700 plus number. But we also have the physical archive, which is right above the IFA uh, institutional office, which is based in Bangalore. And if you are in Bangalore, you can come and visit the archive because we are really happy that after two years of uh, keeping it closed due to um, you know, health reasons during the COVID pandemic time, we have recently opened it and we are enabling visitors to come see and use the archive. Now, it has been our wish that uh, people are able to access material from the archive, but also to build conversations around the archive see what artists feel about the material they have deposited in the archive, uh, the possibilities of their future, the various afterlives that these materials can have, but also look at how artists, scholars actually make use of the archive, build relationships with the archive, and what kind of new meanings do they um, give to the material that is there. And through this material, uh, are able to look at our past histories as well as imagine uh, exciting collaborative futures. So the, the IFA archive has taken on a whole series of public engagement programs. Date with an archive, which we, you are here to witness today, is one such. Um, I'll introduce uh, Vishwadeep Chakraborty, who is the archivist at the IFA archives. And Vishwadeep will tell you a little more about what this specific public engagement of Date with the archive is, and also introduce to you our guest speaker today who will be sharing uh, his work uh, with archives with you. A couple of uh, house rules, uh, you know this is the webinar format. You are either watching us on Zoom or you're going to be wa or you're watching this on the IFA Live page. Uh, we are going to have a question answer session at the end of our guest's uh, talk today. So while we encourage you to put in the chat box comments you may have, suggestions, how you're feeling about the talk, the questions we request you to put either in the Q&A box or as comments under the Facebook live stream. And we will have uh, people from IFA who will be watching out for it. And at the end of today's talk, both Vishudeep and I will be taking Sunil through those questions that you've posted. So with that, uh, let's begin. Vishudeep, your turn now to tell us what Date with the Archive is and who our guest speaker is today. Thank you. Thank you, Rindadi, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Date with the Archive is a series of talks by artists across different practices who have used archives extensively for their creative work to bring to focus the potential of the archive as a significant resource for artistic explorations. For our second talk of the series, Date with the Archive, this evening, we have with us Sunil Shanbag, the Mumbai-based renowned theater director and producer. Sunil is the co-founder and artistic director of Theatre Parna, Tamasha Theatre, 
He is also an award-winning documentary filmmaker involved in several theater and arts documentation projects. Over the past 45 years, Sunil's works uh, spans uh, across themes and issues that concern modern Indian society across class, caste, gender, and other inequalities. Sunil is also involved in training and mentoring young theater practitioners and has been visiting director at Lalit Kala Kendra, University of Pune, Rama School, Mumbai, Ahmedabad University, and the Jyoti Dalal Liberal Arts College, Mumbai. In his presentation this evening, Sunil will engage with the archive, not just a repository of information, but also as a space to think about the past and find new meanings in the present, along with memory as an archive. Sunil, in his talk, will discuss how these ideas influenced two decades of his monumental theater works, during which archives were located and sometimes created to enable the work as well. The talk will try to eliminate this process with references to some specific theater productions. After this product, uh, after this presentation, Orundhati and I will take audience questions. Now, without further ado, I'd request Sunil to please take the stage. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Arundhati. Thank you very much, Bishwadeep, and everybody at IFA uh, for inviting me to this uh, talk and this evening. Uh, it, it's, I'm particularly delighted to be part of you know, this series of date with the archive because uh, I've always felt that you know, we just don't have enough documentation uh, happening and um, especially in the theater. And I've, I've always sort of just responded to this by becoming a bit of a compulsive uh, archivist myself, uh, you know, finding photographs and, you know, memories and things and trying to put them down in some form or the other. Uh, we've also tried to produce, a, you know, a, a kind of a book that looks at the history of uh, the experimental theater in Mumbai through three nurturing spaces, um, essentially through oral histories of people who've participated uh, in theater work at these spaces. Uh, this is a book that was edited by Shanta Gokhale. It's called uh, Scenes We Made. So, you know, there has been a long association with the idea of history, with, with the idea of archive, uh, trying to make connections with the past uh, to understand the present a little better. Uh, just to very quickly give you a short introduction to my interest in this, uh, I, I began discovering my own city, Mumbai, uh, in the 70s. I was away for many, many years. And then when I came back at the age of 17, and I got immediately involved in theater due to you know, certain very, very uh, interesting circumstances, uh, that's when I started discovering the city because I lived in the suburbs and I had to travel to South Bombay to study and also to do a lot of my theater work. And it involved long journeys, especially by a bus route in those days that was a 70 number bus. Uh, and that kind of, you know, took me into the city through the working class areas uh, of Dadar, Bhaikala. And I used to be quite amazed, especially when returning late in the night, how alive those streets were. And it's only later that I realized that it was because these were the mill areas, the areas where large working class populations worked in shifts. So there was always life on the street. And it was fascinating for me to step down sometimes, walk through some of those lanes, and just from the outside get a sense of the place. Uh, do remember that this was the 70s and it was also a very, very tumultuous time in India. Uh, you know, there was the, the I, I remember I was to teach uh, English in, in uh, to young, young students uh, in, in an area in Worli called the BDD Chaws. You know, these are essentially, again, a large working class population. And this was the time when there was a lot of tension between the Dalit Panthers that had just come up as a, as a party uh, and as an organization and the Shiv Sena. And they were, you know, for several months, there was a lot of tension and riots. And, you know, we being in Worli used to be in the midst of that. So I really got a feel of that firsthand. Uh, that was followed by the Great Railway Strike. And then, you know, JP's movement in Bihar that we all heard about and read about with great enthusiasm and interest. And then which finally led to the emergency. So when the emergency was on, I was in college, in fact. And um, like many other students at that time, we all were part of certain activities that kind of tried to find a way to deal with that situation. And of course, then the, the brief moment of, uh, you know, where we felt that when the emergency was lifted and we felt things would get better, and there was this brief moment of you know freedom, and then you know very quickly you realize that it things were not going to change fundamentally. Uh, 
later, and you know, I continued doing theater, but I had to also work to make a living. And I got involved in television. And in television, uh, I had the opportunity actually to uh, work with history and present it in a fictional manner, in, in a manner that would perhaps be more accessible to a wide you know, range of viewership. And uh, I was very fortunate to work with Sham Benegal on his magnum opus, Bharat Ek Khoj, uh, this, you know, 52 part series on Indian history uh, based on Jawaharlal Nehru's book, Discovery of India. But of course, there was a lot of contemporary research that had to be, uh, you know, added to that because, you know, the book was written at a time when there was not that much being written by Indian scholars. Uh, and post-independence, you see a lot of, you know, new Indian scholarship that looks at the same history through a different lens. And, you know, grappling with it, all that material uh, and actually, you know, finding ways to make it interesting for a viewer in, in fiction, semi-fictional, in semi-documentary, you know, forms uh, was, was a huge learning process, huge learning process. Uh, some years later, <clears throat> I worked on a series called Adhikar. Again, all this is in the Doordarshan days before private television came up, uh, where we looked at the legal rights of women and uh, we create, you know, we actually found case studies and based our programs on specific case studies because of which certain laws were enacted or certain movements took place. And again, that was a huge learning experience. So as you can see, you know, it, 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 the interest in history in the past in trying to sort of grapple with that kind of material has always been there. But oddly enough that when we began our own theater company in 1985, Arpana, uh, you know, we were all struggling to find what what our voice was. And at that time, because of a close association with the Marathi Experimental Theatre, Arpana became really one of the few, you know, non-Marathi theatre companies that actually looked at new writing in Marathi uh, and presented it in Hindi translation. And we chose to present it in Hindi because we wanted a wider viewership. We didn't want to be restricted by language in that sense. Uh, and that went on for several years, uh, during which I moved from doing television to making independent documentary films. And once again, that was a learning process because working with some of the most talented documentary filmmakers you know, of that time, uh, I learned how it's possible to construct an argument of ideas, uh, not necessarily a narrative, which is of a story, but a narrative of ideas. And again, you know, it, it, it was a fantastic uh, learning experience. So I always believed that, you know, the world in which I worked and made a living and my theater work were two different things. And, you know, there doesn't, there didn't seem, seem to be anything in common between the two. And it was only in 2006, you know, I mean, many, many years after I had started doing theater that with the production of a play, Cotton 56, Polyester 84 by Ramu Ramnathan, I began to understand how these two worlds could come together. You know, the world of history, the world of archiving, the world of documentation and theater, how they could come together. So I'll just briefly talk about that. This evening, I'm going to give you a few examples of plays in which, uh, you know, this kind of documentary archive based work was used differently in different uh, circumstances for different purposes. And uh, hopefully that will give you an idea of what the approach has been, what we've been trying to do over the last you know, 20 years or so. So while I was in the theater, I always wondered why our you know, middle class bourgeois theater in no way reflected the working class history of Bombay. Uh, one of the one of the amazing things about the city of Bombay has been uh, this tremendous, you know, the influence of working class culture. Uh, it had made it made the city far more democratic, far less feudal than other parts of the country, and it was something. That it's what what people when come to Bombay they say you feel a bit liberated when you're born in, in Bombay, right? You don't get tied down by uh, old orders, old structures. Uh, there is a certain freedom. And I just wondered why this particular history was never really reflected in our theater. So when I got to know through the grapevine that Ramu Ramnathan, whose work I admired even before this, uh, much younger to me, of course, but I'd been watching his work as a young person, was actually working on a play that looked at the history of the mill workers and the textile mills of the city. I was very, very excited. Uh, the textile mills have been the foundation of Bombay's prosperity for many, many years. And that's really how it developed into a major port city uh, in many ways. 
And uh, it's a long history of migration, of, of tremendous uh, struggles, exploitation, victories, uh, a blossoming of culture that was so distinctive that it was called the Girangao culture. So the area where the mills were were called Girangao, which is Marathi is the, the village of, uh, of mills, Girini, the village of mills. And Girangao had its own distinctive culture in terms of its music and you know all kinds of other cultural practices. Uh, because the, the unions of the mill workers were initially dominated by, by the communists, uh, there was a certain certain interaction in the post-independence phase between you know, left-wing progressive writers and, and, and the people of Girangao and the shahirs, the poets, the bards of Girangao and the people of Girangao. And it created a distinctive culture. So it seemed to me that this was a project that in fact could do what one was thinking about. But you see, Ramu had been researching this already for about two years. You know, he had been talking to mill workers. His most of his research was based on oral history. You know, direct testimonies from people, workers, workers' families, trade unionists, leaders, activists, and also he was very inspired by a, a, a monumental work called uh, "100 Years, 100 Voices" uh, by Meena Menon and uh, Neera Adarta. Uh, which is again an oral history of that kind. So I got actually more or less a finished script. There was only a translation to be done because he had written in English and we wanted to play it in Hindi. And uh, preparing the actors for you know this work, and we all felt a great sense of responsibility of representation. You know, we were representing a living community, a living history, and we felt deeply responsible for doing it right and representing it fairly. You know, with all the layering and nuance, and. So right from the point of casting itself, I was very clear that we should find actors who in some manner have some connect in, connection with the male history. And, you know, in, in Mumbai, especially among the Maharashtrian community, it's not hard to do, especially, you know, what, 20 years ago when this happened, it's not hard. Someone always had an uncle or a granddad or somebody else in the family who'd been a textile worker or been involved in the textile mills. So even in choosing the cast, we started looking at that. And then this was a period when you know, a lot of the uh, unions had cases in the labor court against the mill owners for compensation for payment of uh, back wages. Uh, and these cases are up there in the labor court and, you know, a, 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 a union lawyer was being, you know, confronted with a galaxy of, uh, you know, uh, high power lawyers hired by the very, very, you know, powerful mill owners. Uh, and one by one, the unions and the mill workers lost their cases. So during the six months of the rehearsal and production of this play, we were hearing about how they were being demoralized, how you know all hopes were being crushed. And it was very important for the actors to understand what was going on. So, you know, we did things like spending time in the labor court, just sitting around there, talking to people, getting a sense of how what, what the mill workers were being actually confronted with. Uh, I also felt that the culture of Girangao was a very, very important part of the story here. And it would add a very, very interesting layer to just the, to the history and to the politics of that time. Uh, and we, as I said, you know, there was, there was a vibrant music scene, uh, both activist music and, and you know, organic cultural music. And we were very lucky to find uh, a composer, Devdat Sable, who was the son of the, who was the son of the legendary Shahir, uh, Shahir Sable, uh, who in fact was a living repository of a lot of the music of Girangao of that time. So Devda shared that music with us very, very generously and live music entered the play. And it's interesting because then the, my first engagement with live music was with Cotton 56 Polyester 84 and that has become a continuing engagement. As some of you may know that I use a lot of live music and it really, it really the live music added not just a cultural layer, a historical layer, and a deeply uh, profound emotional and intellectual layer to the play. Uh, Cotton 56, you know, traveled a lot. It, it kind of, we, we ran it very, very, uh, uh, we did many, many shows for about three, three and a half years, and it traveled a lot. Uh, yeah, well, here in some of these images, you can see the uh, old archival photographs of the mills. And uh, as you can see, uh, women were very much part of the workforce. Uh, so you, you saw images of the inside. I think after this, if you continue, you'll see the chawls. Uh, yes, this is how 
you know, this was the this was the housing that the mill owners built for the workers. Uh, you know, a running veranda and rooms. And the chawls have become part of Mumbai's folklore, you know, in the sense that plays have been written, you know, based around life in the chawl. So, you know, it's a life out there in the open. Private spaces are just a single room in which often 10 or 12, you know, mill workers would sleep in shifts. But the life actually took place, as you can see, uh, in, the, in the common spaces, both in the verandas and in the open grounds around the uh, chawls. And... There is a great nostalgia about the Chawls in, 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 in Mumbai. But of course, Chawl, people who live in Chawls don't want to live there anymore because they are you know, in very dilapidated conditions. You know, the, the sanitation is very poor and nobody really wants to live in a Chawl anymore. So you know, it's one of those contradictions where we put the onus of you know, preserving heritage on people without any support. And people's aspirations are different. They don't care so much about you know, that, the heritage part of it. Uh, well, the the you, if you skip to the next uh, slide, you'll see, um, yeah, this is the this is the book, One Hundred Years, One Hundred Voices, Mill Workers of Giranga Oral History. That's Bina Menon and Neera Darkar. Yeah, so uh, that was so. I, I was saying that we traveled a lot, and you know, we were playing in Delhi for a festival, and, and you know, there was it, the play was very uh, warmly received in Delhi, and I was sitting and talking with a friend, and I said, you know, why is it that why is it that an audience in Delhi is so interested in the history of mills, textile mills in, 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 in Mumbai, in Maharashtra? And he said, uh, he said a very interesting thing. He says, you know, this story is about displacement, about dispossession. And, uh, and, and you know, in Delhi, around the city, uh, we have uh, deep experiences of this, you know, with, with, the, with the expansion of Delhi and the lands around, whether it's Gurgaon or the surrounding areas being sort of, you know, taken in. So people have a very strong connect to the idea of disposition. And that's interesting because, you know, there is a certain universality in, 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 in the theme uh, that was very interesting. Uh, the other thing where we again had to do a little bit of work was I was very keen that visually also we reflected, you know, uh, the idea of Girangaon. And I, we, we imagined Vivek Zadav, who was the designer, we imagined a huge, you know, looming presence of Girangao on the stage. Yeah, you can show the next slide. And for the visual of that, we went to the works of Sudhir Patwardhan, the, the, the painter for uh, inspiration. You know, Sudhir is one of the painters who has consistently painted wood working class life. And this particular painting of his, where this three layered painting became an inspiration for a huge backdrop that we created. If you show the next slide, we'll see it in the play. This was the design for our backdrop. You can see that it's very, very influenced by Sudhir Patwadhan's painting, but we have done things to it to create, kind of distort it and make it a more dynamic. And on stage, this is what it looked like, if you would like to show that, yeah. So, you know, I like to work with a bare stage, but the looming presence of Girangao is seen throughout the play. And I think that's very important. It sort of you know, is a reminder uh, of that. Uh, one of the other things we did also in terms of, uh, you know, in, in, well, in, in terms of documentation and using it for the play itself is a, a, a sound recordist a professional friend of mine, Suresh Rajamani, uh, went into Girangaon, into one, one of the lanes of Girangaon and kept his recorder running for about six hours, right from about 5.30 in the morning or five in the morning, all the way, you know, six hours later, he turned it around around midday. And what we got was a soundscape of the waking up of Giran now. And, it's, and of course, we collapsed it into a 15 minute kind of, you know, track. But it's so interesting that, you know, if you just listen and imagine the soundscape and where it could be from, it's an interesting combination of the village and of the city. Okay, so you have the sound of birds and hens and, you know, that kind of thing. And also you have the sounds of BST buses and urban and village sounds. And it's a fascinating, you know, kind of uh, audio uh, documentation of what the sounds of the streets of Girangao. So, yeah, so that was a bit about what happened with Cotton 56. This was around, what, 2006. Uh, the, when Cotton 56 Polyester 84 worked as an idea, uh, I, I wanted to take this whole thing further. And, you know, around 2009, uh, you know, uh, We've had we had we had had the BJP at the center. Uh, they they led a kind of a government for the first time, you know, for a full term, uh, right up from 1998 to I think it was 2004. And uh, during this that that time, there was the beginnings of what we see that has been developed later as a strategy. 
uh, and as, as a shift in the whole political atmosphere. Um, a couple of years before that, the, the you know the documentary film, independent documentary filmmakers had come together to form a collective called the Vikab Films for Freedom. Uh, it was basically a collective against the whole idea of censorship because you know independent filmmakers had been asked to now just hold on, uh, just hold on to this. Yeah, just can keep that. Yeah, independent filmmakers had been asked to actually submit censor certificates to take part in a festival, which never was the practice earlier. Uh, and in resistance to the idea of censoring independent work, the collective of Vikalp was formed, and I was very much part of it as, as, a, as a documentary filmmaker. Uh, we all know the history of attacks on uh, the painter Hussein had started well before that. But in 2008, when his paintings were attacked at the India International Center and, you know, destroyed, some of them were destroyed, uh, that was the beginning of, you know, his, his need to flee the country. And we know that, that that's what happened eventually. He never came back. And, you know, all these things were a bit disturbing. You know, there were, there were attacks on, you know, plays, there were attacks on poets, there were attacks on painters. And I was thinking, you know, how can we, I think it's time to talk about the idea of censorship. And if you want to talk about censorship, can we look at censorship in the theater since we are theater people? Uh, and then taking the idea further, if we were to talk about theater censorship in Maharashtra, uh, then one of the most iconic examples of you know a play being subject to censorship and having a long battle with the idea of censorship was Vijay Tendulkar's play Sakharam Binder. So I thought, can we create a play around Sakharam Binder and the idea of censorship? And I was very excited with the idea and, and I knew that you know it needed to be developed. It was just a very, very small kernel of an idea really. So I turned to Shanta Gokhale, who's always been a very, very supportive and close colleague uh, who, you know, Shanta is a writer herself, a historian, a critic, uh, but more important than anything else is someone who has been watching theater consistently for, you know, 50 years. And so the great value in someone who watches theater consistently and in an informed way is that they are able to see the patterns and they see the, you know, the arcs and, you know, the, the graph of actually what is going on. And I asked her, you know, how can we, you know, develop this idea? Would she be interested? And she was instantly interested. Shanta is always extremely enthusiastic and supportive about ideas like this. So she came back with the idea that, you know, the, the, the whole notion of censorship and of sanitization, you know, where, where there is a moral position. And so you clean up things. And, you know, for instance, the folk theater has been subject to that process quite, quite uh, uh, regularly in Indian history. Uh, especially in the post-independence uh, era, uh, when when you know when the middle classes uh, looked to its roots, you know, uh, and to their roots, and you know, tried to re-imagine uh, uh, you know folk culture, but it had to be cleaned up and it had to be set up in the way that was acceptable to the urban middle classes and and to the upper caste. So uh, a process of sanitization took place, and it's akin in a way to you know official censorship except that it sometimes remains invisible. So she said that, you know, we should in fact bring in that layer as well, right? Uh, so you have, you know, the story of Tamasha and how Tamasha got cleaned up, okay? Juxtaposed against the story of how Sakharam Binder, the play, uh, you know, was attacked uh, both by the censor board and by civil society. And this was a very, very interesting possibility, you know, these three layers. And I got very excited about it. Uh, what Shanta had created was a very, very wonderfully structured framework for the piece, but it needed to be filled in with a lot of research. So Iravati Karnik, who went on to become the co-writer of the play with Shanta Gokhale, uh, came in. She was much younger then, and she was sort of very, very enthusiastic about tackling this very, very challenging project. So Ira, Shanta, and I went through, you know, the history of theater of that time, uh, we're talking about 1972 when uh, Sakaram Binder was performed for the first time. Uh, we went into newspaper archives. We went into, uh, you know, uh, censor board archives. I was very lucky to get hold of some amazing material from the Stage Scrutiny Board, which is the name for the censor board. Uh, we also managed to have 
conversations and oral histories from people who are involved in the play. Uh, most importantly, uh, Lalit Sarang, whose husband Kamlakar Sarang actually directed the, and produced the play. Uh, uh, Lalan had very, very strong memories and very powerful memories of, of that time. Uh, we were also very fortunate to meet advocate Ashok Desai, uh, who was actually the lawyer who fought the case in court and, and won uh, the permission for uh, Sakaram Binder to continue performing. Uh, more importantly, Kamlakar Sarang had actually you know, maintained a diary of that time when he was really struggling in this whole battle against the censor board. Uh, and later that was published as a book, and it's quite a popular book in Marathi. Uh, it's called Binder Chidivas, which loosely translates as those binder days. Uh, that book was available. And with Lalan's interviews and the book and conversations with someone like G.P. Deshpande, who, you know, gave us a very interesting idea about the, the whole the, the concept of censorship, uh, we were able to create a fairly interesting script that, again, for the first time, in a sense that I tried to actually... Uh, you know, create an argument of ideas and everything that actually went into it, the performative elements actually supported the argument. Uh, it had scenes from Sakaram Binder, but those scenes were deconstructed and analyzed on stage as they were happening or after they had happened. Uh, we wanted to also look at the context of the play. So, you know, in the 70s, what was happening in Marathi theater and where did Sakharam Binder fit into that? So you see, you know, the kind of slightly more sentimental romantic theater work that's happening around and that's very popular. And then you suddenly some, see something very raw and powerful like Sakharam Binder. And you, you say, well, no wonder people were offended by it. Uh, we looked at ad films from that period, you know, because ad filmmakers tend to understand the aspirational, you know, or, or they create the aspirational values. You understand the pulse of society. And very often, ad films are very revealing about what was happening at a particular time. I mean, they are a bit quaint when you look at old ad films, but if you analyze them, they, they are a very, very interesting record of that time. Uh, so, you know, using personal contacts, some, some official archives, but creating, in fact, an archive, really, uh, because there was no one solid archive that dealt with this. Uh, that is how the play was constructed. Um, we used video, we used music, we used reenactments of plays, uh, we used excerpts from plays of that particular time, uh, we, we, we created scenes from you know, the censor board meetings because we had access to the material records of those meetings. So it was all created as a performance, but essentially it was really in a sense you know, based on documentation. We can have a quick look at the photographs uh, of the play. Uh, if you can run it. Yeah, these are some of the ads from that time. Okay, Sakaram Binder. Um, uh, yeah, so this is Nilu Phule who played Sakaram Binder in a very, very it was a major part for him. Um, yeah, carry on. These are just ads that give you a sense of, you know, what it was. These are some cartoons, you know, about uh, and some newspaper clippings. Uh, there was a lot written in the press about this particular play and the whole controversy around it. Uh, in fact, you know, some of the actors said that I, we, we don't believe that a play today would sort of, you know, attract so much attention uh, from, from the media as it used to in that time. Um, yeah. Well, you can see the how it went through. SS prevents staging of Sakaram Binder. SS refers to the Shiv Sena. Um, yeah. And then the next one says the SS chief gives clean chit. So, you know, there was a private showing for Bal Thakre, sir, and you know, he said, there's nothing wrong with this play. So there are lots of very interesting ironies of history. Uh, these are some, you know, images from the play. You can just run through them, uh, you know, Pranav, uh, just to give an idea. We also talked about what was happening in the world at that time. You know, the 70s was a time of great change all over the world. Uh, you know, the anti-Vietnam protests were going on, the big flower revolution, the hippie movement, new ideas, very kind of a tremendous liberal atmosphere that showed in the works of people like Bob Dylan, you know, and um, Martin Luther King, I mean, amazing time in history. And this is when uh, we are sort of placing uh, this particular play, Satharam Binder. I think it gave us, you know, this kind of a historical context gives a kind of a sense of a, a larger idea of a piece of art. You know, if you, if you agree that, a piece of art is always located in its time, then it's really important to understand the time. And this is where the archive really becomes very, very critical. So these are scenes from the play. This is the Shahir 
and the Lavni dancer who are telling the story of Sakaram Binder and you know exploring the idea of censorship. Uh, this is an enactment from Khadilkar's Kichakwad, which was one of the first plays to be censored uh, in British times. Uh, yeah, carry on, carry on. This is a scene from Sakaram Binder. We played Sakaram Binder in a very synoptic way uh, so that someone who hadn't seen the play wouldn't get left out of understanding what was being discussed and talked about. And it really worked very well as a dramatic element also in the play. So, you know, at this point, I'd like to say that, you know, the archive, of course, is very interesting and the material, you know, informs what you're doing. But how do you actually use it in a kind of, a, you know, in an aesthetic or an artistic way is a completely different process, you know. It's, it's what happens after the material. Sometimes the material tells you, you know, what to do and sometimes you have to find ways to do it. So that's also a very interesting and very, very exciting process. So yeah, this is Sakharam Binder. I hope I'm not going too rapidly. Uh, um, in, um, in 2010, I was asked by uh, a, a, a very interesting cultural organizations in Kolkata, organization in Kolkata called Happenings, uh, to do a reinterpretation of a Rabindranath Tagore play. And, you know, I had two options in front of me. One was to either, you know, go through this huge body of work of this, of this writer, thinker, philosopher, uh, and discover something that nobody had thought about, which is, would be a great ego boost, or, you know, to take something that there was a personal connect with. And I decided to work with Dark Ghar, uh, which is a play that Tagore wrote. And in which I had been involved as a young as a young boy in school in a kind of an unfinished production of Daghar. And I said, well, let me go back to that play because I have memories of that play. And you know, everybody, the biggest directors in in in, in Bengal have done Daghar. I mean, you know, the the list of directors who have done Daghar is very, very daunting. And you know, there is always this thing that if I were to do Dhagdar, if we were to do it, what would we bring to it? What would be different that we bring to it? What, what would we find in it? So there is always a search to how to enter a play. You know, how do you enter a play? What is it that you want to actually do with a play apart from just staging it, you know, which is very, very limiting. And so I started reading around the play, you know, and I tried to say, let me see, okay, let me read around that time. Let me read around that play. And I, you know, I, you know, I had goosebumps when I came across the story of Janusz Korczak, a, a Polish pediatrician in Warsaw, uh, and his connect with uh, this, this particular play. Uh, Janusz Korczak was a pediatrician, a progressive pediatrician who laid great importance on children in society. He believed that children had to be empowered, had to be treated with great respect, uh, had to, you know, have to be allowed intellectual freedom to express themselves. Uh, they had to be prepared always. You, you couldn't spring surprises on them. You had to prepare them for the changing times. Okay. And this is, you know, in the 1930s, 40s, when Europe was going through great, great change. The First World War had happened, and this was the period between the war. And, you know, there was, you know, there was a re whole reorganizing of society and life in Europe. And he really believed that children had to be prepared for this. Uh, he set up an orphanage for Polish uh, children, where he put a lot of his ideas into practice, uh, include, which included, you know, running a newspaper, which was so of such high quality that the, the city newspaper ran their newspaper as a supplement once a week or once a month. Uh, and then, you know, Nazi Germany then started moving across Europe and they, they, they invaded Poland uh, first. And they came into Warsaw and, you know, uh, Janusz Korczak, Korczak and his orphans were moved into the, the infamous uh, Warsaw ghetto, right? Uh, and it was a very, very different atmosphere for the children because suddenly they were in a state of deprivation. They were bored because there was just no scope for any activity. They were falling sick. They were getting demoralized. And more importantly, there was a sense of death looming in the air. You know, there was talk of people being taken away to camps and, you know, being sort of uh, killed in, you know, in, 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 in very, very in strange concentration camps and circumstances. And Korchak felt that the children had to be prepared for the idea of death. And he rushes up to his little attic in, in, the, in this place where they were staying in the ghetto and pulls out a Polish translation of Rabindranath Tagore's Dhaggar. Now, for those who know Daghar, it's the story of Amal, a little orphan, 
who's very sickly and he's been confined to a room. He's been actually imprisoned in a sense in a room by his uncle who wishes for his best, of course, but under the advice of an old fashioned uh, physician who says that fresh air will actually make him ill. And he's a very bright, curious child and he stands, sits at his window and has conversations with passers-by. And it's a very beautiful metaphorical kind of story, um, um, you know, of of this boy's discovery of the world around him through people. And at the same time, he's falling, he's, he's getting more and more sick and eventually he dies in the end, right? And Korchak felt that the child who goes through this experience would be a wonderful way to introduce his children, his orphans to the idea of death. So I read with utter fascination how they put together a production of Daghar in the ghetto, uh, which was watched by you know, other inmates of the ghetto. And I said, this is, this is an amazing way to actually talk about Daghar because it really meant something. Uh, a few days after the performance, and this is documented, eyewitness accounts, a few days of the performance, maybe a month later, uh, the children from the, the orphanage in the ghetto were marched through the streets of Warsaw with, uh, through Warsaw to the railway station with hundreds of other Jewish people bundled into cattle carts to be taken to the concentration camps to be gassed. And eyewitness tells us that, you know, as you can imagine, people were screaming and crying because <clears throat> they knew they were going to their death. But the same eyewitnesses tell us that Korchak with his little group of children held this flag and one of the child was one of the children was playing a violin and they kept their heads high and they marched with utter dignity to the cattle carts. Now, this is how they were able to face the idea of death. Uh, I, I thought this was just, you know, just the way to enter the play. So uh, I got a collaborator, Vivek Narayan, who, you know, who's a, a theater scholar who then went on to Stanford and now teaches in Ashoka University Theater Studies. Uh, and Vivek went into this huge process of actually, you know, researching this whole thing, this, this whole period, this whole particular uh, story of this man. And these, some of these photographs have come out of that. Uh, there have been films made on Korchak. Korchak remains even today in Poland to be a very, very kind of, you know, respected uh, uh, personality. There are statues. If you continue in the images, you will see that there are even, you know, public statues. Yeah, this is, for instance, uh, a public installation. That's Korchak holding his orphans together. There's another one, very beautiful. Yeah. And so... We, we brought these two stories, the historical event of Korchak and the staging of Daghar and, the, 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 and, and Tagore's play. They ran on simultaneously, you know, as parallel stories. And the design of the play created the sense of a concentration camp. So the play begins with, we imagine that Korchak and the children have brought, been brought to the concentration camp in a cattle cart late in the night. Korchak has been separated from his children and put into a cell. And he starts talking about his story, you know, in a moment of facing imminent death. And on the other side of the stage, the door opens and young Amal is brought into the room that he's to be confined to uh, because of his illness, right? So the play, this Daghar plays out on one side of the stage and Korchak and the story of the orphans plays out on the other side of the stage, as you can see in this photograph. And you can see the barbed wire of the concentration camp. And at some point, these two people, one a historical character and one a fictional character, meet in the center space of the stage as just two human beings, as somebody who's incredibly fond of children and highly respectful of children, and a child who's so curious and so uh, interested uh, in ideas, in life, in stories. And these two meet in this imaginary space. And of course, the, the end of the play is that, you know, the stage is cleared. And you realize that you've been watching Daghar as being performed by the children of the ghetto and they're taken away to the concentration camp. And the last image is of them being gassed. So here you see Korchak actually for the first time, you know, engaging with Amal. Carry on with the pictures. I think we can, yeah. So here they are, you know, playing and they get into a conversation. So it's a very interesting thing to bring, you know, a historical character and a fictional character together uh, in kind of some, you know, in thing. And this is the moment when they are being gassed. So you can see that they've changed into their Polish clothes, their Western European clothes, because what you were seeing was actually a sort of performance of uh, Daghar as being done by the orphans in the Warsaw Ghetto.
yeah, so that was that, all right. Uh, in 2015, Jannate Manch, uh, the, the famous theater, you know, theater company in, um, in, in Delhi that works out of Delhi, set up by Savdar Hashmi and his associates and colleagues. Uh, Jannate Manch got into a very, very interesting arrangement with the Freedom Theater in, in Palestine. Okay. Um, for the first time, a group of eight actors from the Freedom Theater. The Freedom Theater is a theater institution that is located in the Jenin refugee camp in the West Bank of Palestine. It sees itself as a very, very strongly a community space, and they exist there to really tell stories of Palestine. It's, it's part of the entire cultural you know, resistance to occupation. And eight actors from there were going to come from, uh, from Palestine to Delhi to work with Janam. Uh, and create a production together. So the Palestinian actors and Indian actors from Jannati Manch were to create a production. But as a kind of a run up to that particular thing, uh, some of the, you know some theater practitioners were invited to come and uh, just hold the slides for a moment. Uh, were invited to come and uh, work with them. So I was invited to spend four days with uh, these actors, and I suggested to uh, Sudhanva Deshpande of Janam, who actually you know invited me to that. You know, I'd like to, I'd like to do, you know, work with them about how memories and history can be worked to tell, and personal stories can be worked to tell stories of a nation, of a people, of a civilization, right? How do you take these things that are, you know, facts and memories and personal things, which are very subjective, and how can you open them up to actually so that they resonate with much, much larger ideas? So this was only a four day work. And though we were working eight hours a day, I think uh, it was a very short period of time. So we really began with, you know, understanding, you know, the shift in history from, you know, a top down approach to, you know, a more, you know, listening to people's voices, the whole importance given to oral history with, of course, all, you know, all what it means uh, and how that can be constructed to reconstruct a particular time. Uh, we started with that. and. Because they were going to tour India, I put a question to them. I said, you know, not many people know about Palestine and Palestine and Palestinian history. Uh, and if people were to ask you, in a sense, to represent your country, what are the stories you would like to tell? Can we talk about that? How would you like to present your lives, your country, your experience? And it was very interesting because they went into a kind of deep period of reflection and they came up with very, very interesting personal memories. Uh, you know, things that they had experienced as young people living in Palestine. Uh, some of the, some of those memories were very, very, I mean, very disturbing. And, you know, I, it, it was a bit worrying that are we being, are we subjecting them to a kind of a, you know, a, a period of trauma that they've been through. But it was also very interesting to see how they had internalized this, how they had created their own, you know, ways to protect themselves. And, you know, often they would just laugh it off and say, yeah, that happens, you know. Uh, but beneath it, you could understand the pain. So what we did was we went through a period, an extensive period of storytelling, of sharing, of my asking questions because many of the associations I couldn't completely understand. So they had to explain the associations and the significance of certain things. And interestingly, they were just not stories and memories about occupation. Of course, they were there. I mean, there was a story of this young man who, during uh, one of the one of the insurgencies, one of the not insurgencies, one of the intifadas, uh, intifadas, uh, had actually had to go across a part of the city to get home an aunt who was who had been left alone in her house, and the streets were full of you know tanks and Israeli soldiers. And uh, he's confronted with a tank that lowers its turret, its gun, and points it straight at him, this young boy in the middle of the street. And the, the sheer terror and how he spent the night on the street because he just couldn't find a way home. Uh, so it ranges from that kind of thing to torture and interrogation to also very, very interesting things about, you know, finding your own voice in the middle of all this conflict, finding your own voice or fighting a battle at home, uh, which, you know, which, which, which kind of is an attempt to break gender stereotypes, you know, a young man who wants to sing and who wants to act and, you know, it's not being seen as masculine enough to do, or somebody else who's interested in makeup and, you know, wants a career in that. So the range of stories and experiences that came up were very rich and very, very different. And 
very soon they realized that you know personal stories somehow need to be uh, supported by larger ideas you know uh, they needed to resonate with you know shared expression you know in, in terms of music in terms of poetry uh, in terms of you know you know folklore or mythologies uh, that society throws up so your your personal experience then opens up and becomes far bigger and far more universal you know it begins to resonate with other people uh, we chose to do the entire performance in arabic because that is what they were comfortable with and we we didn't have the time to engage with language as an obstacle uh, there was just one performance of this play done i mean i don't know if you could call it a play but one performance of this particular experiment done uh, but it was very very fulfilling and uh, it was for me very interesting because it's the first time I was actually working with devising, you know, in the sense that on the floor with actors, I tend to work with, you know, with, with a finished script. We work a lot on the script. Of course, we spend a year, a year and a half working on a script. But when actors come into the room, then it's really a finished thing and they have to, they add to it. Of course, all live actors will always add to something, but you have a pretty much a clear idea of where you're going. But this was the first time where I was really trying to work with, in a very different way. And so it was a very interesting uh, uh, sort of experience for me. Yeah, we can see some images. I think just there are a few images, uh, Pranav, if you don't mind. Yeah, this is the rehearsal room. This is Janam Studio Safdar, where this work is happening. Uh, yeah, these are some of the young actors. You can see the, the animation and the brightness. Yeah, carry on. Yeah, I think this is all the images that I have. Unfortunately, I don't have images of the performance itself. Uh, but that will have to be corrected. That's a that's a problem in my uh, in my archive. That's a it's a lack. It's a gap there. Uh, all right. I think. Do we have time, Arundhati Pranav? Can we do? I stop here, or shall I continue with one more example? What do you think? Uh, you can continue with one more, uh, yeah. Sunil. I think, and then we'll move to the uh, all right. Yeah. All right. Okay. To get some quickly. questions. Yeah. Sure. Sure. All right. So. Uh, I think the period after 2014 uh, was has been a very, very difficult period for uh, theater people uh, and generally for the arts and you know, people at large, I guess. Um, and two of, play, two of my plays responded to the times. One was a play that, you know, that responded to the, you know, in the soon after 2014, they were you know, we were being asked to prove our Indianness. You remember this whole period where we were being asked to prove our Indianness? And I did a play that actually responded to that idea, but that was that was not based on an archive. It was really, you know, it was it was different. It used a lot of satire and that kind of thing. But the other play that I looked at was I said, you know, we need to we need, we need to really look at the idea of dissent conceptually you know what is dissent what role does dissent play because you know the whole idea of dissent has been so uh, how should you say it has been made uh, illegal right in the sense that anything dissent is equal to anti national you know so this kind of binary that exists and is being sort of promoted and hugely supported i said we need to open a conversation about this obviously you can't sort of you know there's no point in getting into a street fight about this it doesn't make sense there aren't enough conversations about this. So we said that suppose we created a theater piece that looked at the idea of dissent and across time, all right, the idea was to say that dissent is universal, to demonstrate that dissent is universal. It's independent of time. It's independent of culture, of geography. It exists as a part of human society. Okay, there is always going to be a majority opinion and there's always going to be a minority opinion. It's always going to happen. These, these moments will come. And, 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 and we, as a civilization, we move forward only when you allow dissent. All major shifts in society, all major shifts have taken place because of the tension between you know, these two points of view, two points of view. And honestly, that's the whole point of theater also, Okay, that there is a tension, the dialogue, the whole idea of dialogue is counter views, right? Uh, so we've been reading a lot about this and we said, let us look at expressions of dissent, you know, many very forms of dissent. Uh, so we looked at poetry, we looked at music, uh, we looked at theater pieces, yeah, that, that, that dealt with idea of dissent, uh, satire, right? Uh, 
biographical or autobiographical writing, letters, various, various, you know, various forms of expression, of cultural expression, and across the world. So we were looking at material from India, of course, from Afghanistan, Syria, Pakistan, the USA, Palestine, Iraq, you know, a couple of European countries. Uh, and we started structuring these texts, you know, again, constructing an argument. Uh, there were three of us who worked on this project. There was Sapan Saram, who's a partner and co-founder at Tamasha Theatre. There's Iravati Karnik, who we just heard, who worked on sex morality and censorship and continues to be a very, very uh, highly regarded colleague and, and me. And three of us, you know, put together a whole lot of stuff that excited us. And then we, and Ira and Sapan started structuring it as an argument. And wherever there were gaps, we filled those gaps, okay? And we decided that this would not be performative in the sense of a conventional play. So it's eight of us actors sit around in a shallow semicircle with our books, our material around us. And some things we read, some things we perform, okay? Uh, some things we just talk about. And this is a two hour performance. I in fact now call it a sharing. Uh, and basically you're taken through the idea of dissent and broadening up the idea of dissent, where it's not just about a relationship between the individual and the state or the state institutions, but it's also about dissent in areas like you know, gender politics, in, in, in the whole ideas of sexuality, in the whole idea of caste. So broadening the idea of dissent, that dissent exists around in, in every possible manner, wherever there are human beings and there are, you know, life is at play, there is going to be dissent. Uh, it was interesting that, you know, for instance, you know, at, at a very, very important and major theater festival that we were very keen to be part of, the play was rejected because the jury felt that this is not really a play because, you know, where's, where's, where's the action? Where's the drama in this? Uh, we believe that there is a drama of ideas. And of course, you know, there is also performative elements. And how do we define what is theater? But that's that's a much longer argument. So we won't get into that. So I'm just trying to say that it was an unconventional presentation. Uh, and I think, again, there was an archive that was actually created to support this idea of this performance. Uh, the archive was created by actually digging, reading, finding, seeking material, putting it together and giving it some form. So then it becomes an archive of cultural expression about dissent, right? And this archive is available. And, and as a recognition of this, uh, after the show, we actually hand out booklets to people in the audience, which contains all the text and all the material that we have actually performed so that people have access to this archive that has been created. Uh, so that was an interesting experiment, and, and I'm glad to say that, uh, you know, this year we plan to revive Words Have Been Uttered. Uh, I, think, I, think it's, it's, it, I think it's an important thing to be done now. Uh, and yeah, and I hope, you know, we can, we can show it and, you know, to as many people as possible. So yeah, these were a few of my sort of, you know, engagements. Uh, uh, this approach has colored most of my work, um, you know, for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, these are a few examples, and I hope they've given you an idea of, you know, how it is possible for a theater maker to work with, you know, with an archive, either a formal archive, a created archive, or an informal archive. And a memory is really an informal archive, which is why I use the term informal archive. Uh, so I think I'll stop now. And um, I think we can just show them some images from words have been uttered and then throw it open to questions. Yeah. This is actually a collage. Yeah. If you can play this video, it's about two minutes long. Yeah. These are these are landes, which are landes are a form of poetry written by women in Afghanistan uh, during the Taliban period, which has returned, of course, as you know. Uh, when sisters sit together, they always praise their brothers. When brothers sit together, they sell their sisters to others. Now you can see you know, the kind of powerful writing that is coming out, you know, this invisible world of women who are otherwise completely covered in burqas, unable to show themselves in private. So these are a few images from the play. 
this is a, a satirical piece from Syria. This is Galileo, you know, uh, who has faced the wrath of the church. This is a scene from Udhvas Dharamshala uh, by G.P. Deshpande. And this is the rendering of a poem, Dear Democracy. This is another land day written by a young girl uh, on her deathbed. I call your stone. One day you look and find I'm gone. Very poignant. All right. So I'm open to you know, any questions. And thank you so much for listening patiently uh, to this. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Sunil, for this conversation. Just to ask the the, the poems, the couplets that um, the uh, women from Afghanistan. I wasn't there. This uh, phone network that was created. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah. And Not phone network. See, not... Earlier, it was just how technology entered the thing. So earlier, yeah. they would sort of, you know, when they met in groups, they would share poems, and there's no authorship to these poems because yeah. the poem is whispered in their yeah. private little groups. Yeah. And yeah. then someone picks it up and adds to it, and then it yeah. becomes land day, right? Yeah. Yeah. But in the but but then you know, with migration, with population shifting to different parts of the world, the the act of writing poetry continues among the women, and then they start using the internet, and chat rooms become the space. Become the space for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then the land day start, you know, also talking about war and talking about mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. about sexuality and the oppressive nature mm -hmm. of their society, but also about what is happening to their country by you know occupational forces. So. Yeah. It, it's a it's an incredible form of expression of yeah, dissent, yeah. you know. Sure. I and so you know before we go on to the um, conversations that are uh, the questions that have come up, we have quite a few. I just had one question. You know, today we talked a lot about the archive, but there's one aspect of the archive which is sort of the other side, which is the silence of the archive. And an archival space also creates silences to stop certain things from being um remembered in history of and it, it happens like almost three times you know first when you choose what to put in then when you put that in and then when you look at sources you put that in and then when you're retrieving it also so you can actually leave out tons of voices tons of stories i was wondering that when an artist like yourself or any kind of artist is looking at an archive uh how do they handle or how do you think you have or others could look at these silences is there an artistic um what should i say like a strategy or intervention because you're working not just with fact but this mix of fact and fiction yeah. could your intervention be very different from say scholarly interventions into archives which can hardly fill this gap in any way because neither do they have the right so to say nor the privilege of actually being uh, a fiction maker so is, is there a little wicked, um, almost naughty way of engaging that artists can take liberty with? Well, I, I, I think, I think you know, if you want to talk within the context of, you know, academic research, if you, if you see that, you know, we, we don't restrict ourselves. I mean, not because there aren't that many archives that necessarily are designed to deal with a particular idea that you're working with. It's, it's not like you go into an archive, look at the collection and then come up with an idea, right? That's one way of doing it, right? Here it's the other way. You have an idea and then you have to find material that kind of, you know, validates that idea, supports that idea, illuminates that idea. So if you talk in the, we do a, a lot of our approach is field work, as you can see. You actually go to different spaces looking for material. If you find that, you know, a particular aspect of, of, of an idea is, is remains silent and it's not seen, you know, necessarily in office. You find ways to locate it, okay, either through people. So, for instance, in sex morality, a lot of our understanding comes through people's own memories and, you know, oral histories, right? And that's really, in, in a sense, it's like the you're going back to the fundamental basic sources, you know, the raw raw material, the the uh, the primary sources in a sense. Um, I don't think I've ever had the, uh, I've never really entered an archive, which is a formal archive. Okay, like the censor board has its, it's not an archive, they have their records. Okay, yeah. they don't even see it as an archive. Yeah. Yeah. And hence there has been no real uh, intervention in what is kept and what is not kept. Oh, so oh. I had access to a file that was, that was labeled controversial place file. 
and that was handed to me. Yeah. Okay. There was no intervention. They had no clue what I was going to do with it. Yeah. Okay. And they just handed it to me in good faith. And I think there was some enlightened moment there in that in yeah. that in that setup, right? Yeah. So we don't really have that experience. But yes, I'm very very aware about how archives can be, uh, how power equations play out in archives. What can be kept invisible, and yeah. what is allowed to be visible. Yeah. And I think I think it's a very very important thing to keep in mind when you are actually uh, looking at that kind of approach to your work. You know. The other thing is as artists and you know you you smiled and says that we have naughty strategies the point is that we do take you know we we can take recourse to you know uh, dramatic or poetic liberties or you know artistic liberties okay mm -hmm. we don't we always don't we never claim to be you know setting it out in that degree of authenticity as say a researcher has that pressure right mm -hmm. a research scholar can't mess around you know mm -hmm. they have to have supporting things right mm -hmm. so even if you know that something did happen but it's invisible you can only hint at it you can only talk about it but you can't really actually say we are not we don't have those constraints you can actually so, make a character say it if you want yeah, you can make a character say it you know for instance this whole business of giving temporary census certificates to a play that's likely to cause you know uh, uh, some kind of an uproar uh, you know so that you know if something happens and if there is a protest against the play the censor board can say oh we knew and that's why we gave them a temporary certificate so cop out now mm -hmm. when we were doing sex morality and censorship we had a temporary certificate mm -hmm. and at the end of the play we used to say you know the only reason we are doing this is because we have a temporary certificate it can be withdrawn anytime mm -hmm. now we can be subversive in that way you know and i think that's certain advantages that we have yeah uh sunil i have a question uh, before we take the audience questions so uh, you beautifully uh, talked about uh, the stories of Palestine and before that, uh, how you constructed uh, Saharam Binder as a play, as an archive or around documentation. So uh, my question is, as we know that archives tell stories uh, that without careful preservation would perhaps be lost to time. So in, uh, in case of Saharam Binder, the way you curated the images, all those images, the archival images, how do you see uh, the afterlife uh, of uh, those materials? IFA archive. <laughs> no, honestly, Vishwadeep, you actually asked a very, very important question. Uh, for the last year or so, I have been really, you know, really thinking very hard about where one can actually place a lot of material that we have used and have not used, that we have collected. I have a huge visual archive of, uh, you know, experimental theater work in Mumbai uh, over a period of 15, 20 years, which we painstakingly gathered from different theater companies, scanned the images, and we have categorized them, they have kept them. Now, this is an archive that I felt was important, and it came up because we were also working on the book scenes we made, so that became something that we could do. But now it's there, it's lying on my hard drives, and I'm worried, you know, that something could happen, right? And where can I place this? So this is a very important question, and I think, and, and, and archives can only be really institutional if they have to be of a certain scale, you know? We put the we put the onus of all this on on individual theater practitioners, arts practitioners. It's unfair, you know. This is what large cultural institutions should be doing. Oh. Why are we having to do this? You know, we can contribute to this, but why do we have to take the responsibility for this? You know what I'm saying? So I really believe that in some sense institutions let us down. Oh. Let us down in let down history, let down the whole you know domain. It's not personally. I mean, it's not personal at all. You know. Sure. So, um, uh, Vishwadeep, shall we start taking the questions? So. I'll take one, yeah, yeah, and sure. maybe then you can take another. So, sure. this is this is actually a comment, and where um, I I think the person is asking you to also respond. Uh, this has come from Facebook. Uh, this is from Aditya Nigam, who's saying thanks for this wonderful and thought provoking talk, Sunil. You made a point about theater being rooted in its time and the context being important, but Darkhar and Korzak's story actually tells us something about art and theater speaking and having effects beyond their time and context. I won't say this is about universality, but not everyone in different contexts would have related to, to it. This is more about resonances of different contexts, which may or may not be historical in its relation to, to time. Uh, to just clarify the last bit, the way an artwork of theater speaks to us may not have anything as realistic as history, but let us say more poetic, where the play of imagination is more important than its realistic meanings. Would you like to comment? 
Oh my God, that's a lot of time. Thank you, Aditya, for posing a very, very challenging question. No, you're right. If you're right, I mean, you know, I, I I tended to stress on the history and the the that aspect of it because of the context of this talk. Uh, but that's really what what we try to do is, you know, how can you how can you you know how can you use the material? How can you place the material so that it resonates not just across time but across cultures and in 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 a completely different framework and a completely different context? I mean, to give you an example, you know, when we were putting together material for words have been uttered, it was amazing how texts written four hundred years ago resonated with the fears of contemporary times, right? And I, I think it's really important to see these connections. And I think it's important to place this context because I think part of our work as artists is to make these connections and, and present them as connections. Uh, and, and, and I think gives people amazing insights into things, you know, and how things are so connected and how so, uh, how so bound actually over time. Uh, and that has really been there. And if you remember at one point, I made that comment that, you know, the part of one's work is not just to gather the material and you know place it there but also how to put that material to use so that it is evocative it is poetic it's aesthetic and it says more than just the obvious yeah uh, i think the moment where korchak is brought into his cell and parallelly amal is brought into his little room is is a moment of that kind you know it it it, it allows for that connection to be made and you suddenly said, oh, my God, OK, now this is suddenly making sense, but making a completely new sense. So I think that's what we strive to do. Uh, so, Sunil, we have a question uh, from Deepak Sinha. Uh, he first said that uh, such an exciting talk. Could you share about documenting plays on the radio? How can we take uh, our stories to the radio? Would you be involved in any archival project on the radio? Thank you so much for the beautiful talks, Sunil, sir. Thank you, Deepak, for that. Uh, I, I don't know what you mean by archiving on the radio. Uh, if you mean audio documentation, what is it that you're actually asking? Uh, you know, the, yeah. So, so we, are, we record all our work, okay? We record them. I mean, ever since video became available and cheap, meaning it was affordable, then we started recording our work. And prior to that, I used to do audio recordings of our work. Uh, usually these are functional efforts because you do an audio recording because in case you have to replace an actor, there is some reference and you don't have to explain the whole damn thing. But it also becomes an archive, a kind of a you know document of that. Uh, video recordings are done because, uh, and, and done with single camera, which we hate showing anybody because you know, festivals now require video recordings when you send your entry, you know, they, they, they don't want to come and see the play. They are very happy to just look at a video recording of the play. So they're done. So these are, I mean, these are documentations, but these are not documentations that can be shared in any great way. I mean, they don't hold much interest for an audience watching. There's nothing more dead than watching a performance of a play shot with a single camera within a frame. It doesn't in any way recreate the feeling of a live performance. And we are most embarrassed to show our work that way. But that's all, you know, resources are scarce and we do it. And those who have the money can record it, you know, in a, in a more kind of, you know, interesting way. But during the lockdown, we were thrown into a situation where live performance was not possible. And we had to then depend on podcasts and, you know, Zoom as a, as a theater space to present our work. And during that period, we did a few experiments with this whole idea, you know. Uh, uh, we, 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 we did recordings of new writing, which were presented as podcasts for people who were interested in new writing, you know, where you could just sit back and you didn't need a visual. So you just heard it on your headphones. And you know where podcasts are so particularly so important and so popular right now, you know, all over the world. So I think you what you have said is that it's a it's an area of huge potential and great promise. And I really do wish that that space could be occupied more uh, in a more active way, uh, you know, by by arts practitioners, especially theater people. Uh, but it is still to be done. It is still to be done. Uh, okay, so we have another question uh, for you uh, from Robin Singh. So Robin said that uh, were there any challenges you faced in the creative presentation of your research from the archives? Are there some fundamentals that one should be mindful? of uh, while presenting such material creatively? The challenges are, of course, there, Robin, as much as there are in any, you know, in any piece of work, you know, there are challenges. Uh, 
you know, how, how do you actually work with the material so that it's engaging? How do you make it accessible? I think these are some of the things that I think a lot about, you know. Uh, for me, it's really very, very important to communicate with an audience. Uh, uh, I, 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 you know, I try very hard that the work, the ideas that we are presenting are as accessible as possible without dumbing down, without being disrespectful to the intelligence of the audience, all right? Uh, let me add that. Um, um, I think we play a very, very important role. We have a great responsibility as arts practitioners to connect and to make our work accessible. Uh, so I think that's the biggest challenge. And I, I don't think it's kind of, you know, just uh, refers only to, you know, working with archival material or history. I think it's a general thing. Um, uh, I think you have to use your imagination. You know, I think you have to find ways to present it so that, you know, we always hear this, this phrase, history is dry, dry history. Are yeah, dry history you present career. You have to find ways to get over all these, you know, mental blocks and prejudices that people have, uh, you know, another political play oh god another historical play you know we have to get around this we have to find ways that bridges can be built and people are actually excited about that i think that's the challenge i uh, so uh sunil wanted to read out uh, a very interesting comment that's come from sangeeta dharmarajan the talk reinforces the possibilities of what can be considered archival the addition of context and positionality to materials in an archive through creative outputs like theater destroys conventions of power that are associated with traditional archives when you expand what can be an archive, representation is extended to communities hitherto ignored in mainstream archival practices. I think this is the same that the silent Let question me, will come back. Yeah. In a wonderfully yeah. precise way, she's yeah. put her finger on exactly what it is. Thank you so much, Geeta, for that. Yeah, Sangeeta. Thank you. Sangeeta, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sangeeta, for that. Uh, I think we have a couple of more. Uh, so, uh, Vardhan Deshpande, very exciting and interesting talk. Um, Vishuddeep, shall I take the next question? Yeah, sure. Take, yeah, think. the one from uh, Prachi. Yeah. yeah so, Prachi Pandey has uh, a question as well. I have seen the play words are uttered and was totally mesmerized by the play. The importance of this play is very significant in these difficult times in the politics of the country. My question is, how do you see the news about theatre people being harassed, being scared to death in current times? Should a young theatre practitioner be careful of politics or politicians in the country? Ah, interesting question. Uh, so it's very interesting that, uh, you know, uh, words have been uttered was done, I think, in 2016 or 17, right? Uh, and uh, a year later, we were invited to Ahmedabad to perform this place, a uh, play in an open air space, right? So we were out there in the open, amplified, and it turned out to be Republic Day. So there was that little, you know, dimension to that evening as well. And uh, everybody was a bit nervous, all right? Uh, but we just went ahead and did the performance. And, you know, as we should have imagined, the audience was extremely supportive and they sort of, you know, came back and were, were very happy with that, that they had been actually, you know, allowed that space to think reasonably about things. Uh, but you're right, the times are such that it is scary in the sense that you always worry, what is it about what you will say or do that will then cause offense, okay? In a sense, that's the age we live in. And, and, and causing offense does not come out of any, necessarily out of any logic or any rational, okay, this happened, so this has caused offense. It needn't, right? There's complete irrationality about it. And... I remember while we were researching uh, sex morality and censorship and in a conversation with GP Deshpande, he said, you know, official censorship is easy to handle. Okay. Very often it's an institution like a censor board. It has rules, regulations, and then sometimes there is also recourse to appeal, et cetera, et cetera. Right. You can handle that because you, you know, it's a structure, it's formal. What is really scary is the censorship of the mob. And I think that's what most artists are worried about. Okay, uh, where you will be subject to a harassment where there is no logic for it, there's no rationality. I mean, as much as someone has not even seen a piece of work that they're attacking, right? So then what is the conversation that can take place? Having said that, it also, that doesn't mean that you stop working, okay? Uh, if you study theater history, if you look at what has happened to it in different parts of the world, uh, 
arts practitioners, and I'll talk about theater people, have always looked for strategies that can get around these things. Okay, there have been strategies. I mean, you know, pre-independence, Khadilka wrote Kichak Wad, and it's oh. essentially a story from the Mahabharat, but oh. it's a metaphor of what is happening in the country. And at some point, the British saw through that, and then they banned the play. And then they looked at every play with suspicion because they didn't know what the hell this play was talking about, because then you have to understand the, the specific culture of that. So it, there are very interesting records of the confusion among the British. So their response was to get even more uh, harsh and, and, and in their enforcing of the laws, new laws were enacted, da, da, da. And interestingly, the Dramatic Performances Act that comes out of that period is what we are living with 75 years after independence. I think it's so ironic, right? That we are being governed by a colonial law that actually put, so anyway, so let's not get into that. So you still have to continue working. You have to find your own strategies. Uh, our strategy is that, you know, is how do you create safe spaces for people to talk to have reasonable conversations, uh, to, to be able to be heard without being yelled at or without being trolled. It's interesting that, you know, what defines the political also is dependent on the time that you're defining the political. Mm -hmm. So suddenly in today's time, even what, you know, 10 years ago would seem so ordinary becomes radically political, right? So I think we have to figure these things out. And I believe that we have to be, we have to find a way to be here in the long run. We can't we, we, we shouldn't be short-sighted. We have to have a longer idea of our need to keep working. And, you know, I think that's what really defines our strategy. Right. Uh, so, Sunil, we have two more questions and uh, then we'll end. Yeah. So, uh, from Facebook, Prachi Sibyl asked you that, uh, have you made the archive that uh, you have created accessible in any way to other practitioners or researchers? No, Prachi. Unfortunately, it's a... It's, it, it's 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 exactly what I've been you know worrying about. How does one make it? I mean, a lot of people do come to me when they find out that I have stuff, or I offer the stuff to people when I find that there is a need for this. But I have don't have the wherewithal to actually create a you know some kind of an internet site or some kind of thing where you know uh, it can be made accessible. But I would really like to hand over the material to an institution or an archive that can actually do this. And I'd be very happy. The material doesn't belong to me. I've just happened to hold it, uh, you know, in trust. So I'd be very, very happy to share it with an institution that is willing to, you know, make it available. Yeah. Right. So uh, the one last question from Dr. Geeta Bindal. She asked that, uh, can I watch the play Shakaram Binder as uh, you put it on stage? And it appears, Sunil, sir, that you believe in art for life, uh, art for life's sake, instead of art for art's sake. <laughs> I like that turn of phrase, art for life's sake. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I, I do. I do. I think I think a lot of us do. Uh, we live for life's sake. So, you know, why not arts for life's sake? Uh, you can you can't see uh, you well you're talking about uh, sex morality and censorship which is actually more than just sakaram binder uh, during the during the lockdown we did try to use that material uh, you know in in some form or the other that would make it interesting for people we called it the guided viewing we did a kind of a guided viewing of the play sex morality and censorship uh, we also did some you know online presentations of the history of theater in mumbai which is a very very fascinating and exciting history which i'm extremely fond of uh, we did that so we tried to do that kind of thing but no to answer your question more directly this play is not available directly for public viewing uh, it can be made available to you if you're interested in having a look, uh, but you'll have to sort of get in touch with me and we'll have to figure out the modalities of it. Ideally, if there is a group of you that are interested in watching the play, then that is something that we can definitely would like to do. Yeah. Uh, Sunil, so this is something we had talked about earlier that if we have a little time, we will do, which is actually ask you about the, during the pandemic, when everything went online and your work with archives during that time, the series called uh, Playing to Bombay, and um, if we, we do have a few minutes, would you like to share a little bit about that or show us something? Yeah, I mean, so, I don't know how you want to do it. Yeah, no, I'll just give you a little brief background and it's a two, two and a half minute clip, I think. Okay, that we have. okay. And, uh, and we should leave after that, we can we can close then. Sure. Yeah, I think yeah. we should. No, it's been, people have been very patient. Thank you so much. 
Uh, yeah, well, so during the lockdown, of course, all theater people all over India, all over the world were figuring out what to do, how to do it, you know, kaise, there's no live performance. On one hand, there was a purist position that said anything on the digital domain without a live audience is not theater. No. On the other hand, there were people saying that, no, 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 we, you know, this can be, we can find ways. And very, very interesting experiments were made, you know, and I, I think, I think theater people learned very quickly uh, how to use the digital space in such amazing ways. So I am very admiring of that. Uh, our response was also, we also tried to respond to it. And one of the things we did was we created a thing, something called Theater Nama, which is a series of online presentations. And the first thing was the guided viewing through sex, morality and censorship, which kind of, you know, made the play, the production of the play, uh, 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 an archive, okay, that we then presented to people and talked about. So you weren't expecting to see a full-fledged performance with shot with five cameras, that kind of thing. You were actually looking at archival material. So you're much more forgiving about archival material than you are about something that's happening. So we did that. <laughs> The other thing that we did, no, you know, it really, we really needed to figure out how to use that material, you know, shot with a silly single camera. And it seemed to work because there was, everything was being given a context and being deconstructed. Uh, the other thing that I'm, you know, very personally, very interested in is the history of theater in Mumbai or Bombay, as it was called. Bombay has a very, very short theater history compared to other parts of the country or modern theater, you know, what we call modern theater. And we, we created a piece called Playing to Bombay, which, uh, which I worked in great, very close collaboration with uh, actually a, a, a theater research scholar, Sharmishta Saha, who is also a practitioner and also a teacher. She teaches at IIT Mumbai uh, and uh, has actually done a lot of work on this particular period. So the two of us, with help from, you know, uh, colleagues of hers, animators, uh, you know, our own skills in making documentary and shooting and using video. We did recreations, we did animation, basically took the audience through uh, Bombay's theater history till the point that in 1896, the city was hit by plague. Okay, so we thought it was very interesting to be talking about Bombay's theater history and ending at the time of the plague when we had the whole city had ground to a halt because the whole country, the whole world had ground to a halt because of COVID, right? So we found that an interesting parallel and uh, it was great fun because, you know, we were restricted in our movements, in our access to materials, but we somehow managed to do that. And um, it was, it was, it was great fun putting that together. And, you know, I have a short, very short collage of it, which give you an idea of the kind of elements that we use. If you want, you can run that. I think it's the last part of the PPT. This is the home of South Mumbai once known as Bombay Green. It was here that Bombay's first theatre building called the Bombay Theatre came up in the 1770s. Today the imposing town hall, better known as the Asiatic Society and Central Library overlooks the Honiman Circle. But the Bombay Theatre was built almost half a century before the town hall. Not much is known about the early years of the Bombay Theatre, but there is a reference in the Bombay Courier of 1793 which says that the managers of Bombay Theatre want to stage the much admired comedy The School of Scandal and that they would like the readers to share a copy of the play script with Captain Hawks, the house manager of the theatre. Bombay was on the sea route for performers travelling from England to Calcutta and many of them halted in Bombay and were found performing at the Grand Road Theatre. Well known among these was Dave Carson who came to India in 1861 and quickly became popular with Indian audiences across the country. He is reported to have earned a fortune during his 20 years of touring India. Dave Carson belonged to the blackface minstrel tradition that was very popular in the United States from the 1830s where white performers painted their faces black and depicted highly racist stereotypes of black people in song and dance. But as you will see, Dave Carson was a bit different. He had adapted to Bombay audiences. I've seen a deal of gaiety, I lead a jolly life. I've seen a deal of gaiety, I lead a jolly life. My name is Rati Mad, I'm the Parsi doctor's wife. The thing I most excel in is dressing me to die. And that's the theater. The theater is a big deal. 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 The theater
बसायची व्यवस्था ते असे भरधरी पडते ते सगळे पाहून भागच हरपले म्हटलं इथे जर खेळ करावयास मिळाला तर उत्तम होईल परंतु चौकशी केल्यानंतर असे लक्षात आले की दिवाबत्तीसह त्या जागेचे भाडे पन्नास रुपये होते म्हणजे आता इथे खेळ करणं दुरापास्तच गोष्ट परंतु मग आमचे मित्र आमच्या कामास आले नाना शंकर शेठ आमच्या कामास आले आणि आम्ही त्या युरोपियन थिएटरामध्ये जाऊन खेळ केला त्या युरोपियन व्यवस्थापकाने आम्हाला सर्व समजावून सांगितली त्यानुसार खेळ झाला खेळ हे उत्तम झाला अनेक पारसी मंडळी त्या भागात राहणारी पारशी मंडळी तो खेळ पाहावयास आली आणि वाहवा मिळून Yeah, so that there's a little excerpt from there. That was Dave Carson, the blackface minstrel mm-hmm. act. And that was Vishnu Das Bhave relating his first experience of visiting the famous Grant Road Theater and then later on. So Vishnu Das Bhave is sort of, you know, uh, considered the pioneer of modern Marathi theater. And that's really his, that was the moment when, so that's a recreation, obviously, there's an actor playing Vishnu Das Bhave. But the words he's spoken are documented and recorded words in Vishnu Das Bhave's own language from his own records. So there's lots of uh, comments coming up saying, and we want more, the next chapter of history of theater in Mumbai. And we agree, etc., etc. So just so you know, Sunil, lots coming up, uh, lots of expectations coming up on that one as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vishati, shall we? And thank, yeah. Hey, you're on mute, Baba. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Sunil, once again. Uh, it has been a pleasure spending this evening with you. Uh, and thanks a lot for engaging us so deeply and sharing such a wonderful talk and such wonderful material, to be very honest, from your archive. Uh, I want to thank everyone who participated uh, both on Zoom and on our Facebook Live. This session has also been rewarding thanks to your insightful questions. The IFA archive will be back soon with similar evenings. But before that, do join us for our next project showcase where the project is supported by IFA are presented by the project coordinators. The next project showcase is titled Matchbox, Lighting Many New Ideas, a presentation by Syed Fakruddin Husseini. So do join us tomorrow on Friday, August 19, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. in the evening. Thank yeah, you. Just to, just to say that tomorrow's uh, presentation will be in Canada because it's part of our arts education Kali Kali Su, uh, right. program, but there will be translations that we will put up in the chat box. So. Uh, even if you don't understand Canada, do do join us. Uh, and we should from all of us at IFA, a big thank you to Sunil and to the Indorama Charitable Trust for supporting the IFA archive from its very inception and continuing to do so. So thank you so much. Thank you everybody thank you. for listening so patiently and thank you all of you at IFA for having me. My pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.